Hi everyone, this is Religiolog, and in this review, relying on renowned scholars in the field of early Christianity, I'll focus on the life of the Apostle Paul, a man who significantly influenced the course of the entire history of mankind. No, seriously, think about it. Some experts of Christianity claim that it was Paul and his disciples who really reformed Christianity by making it easy for non-Jews to convert to the Jesus movement. This way they created the foundation for global religion. In many ways it is due to Paul that it became possible for Christianity to move away from being a small sect between Judaism to being a worldwide religion. As Douglas Jacobson states, today Christianity is the most diverse and globally dispersed religion on the planet. Christians are spread almost evenly around the world, 25% in Europe, 25 in Africa, 25 in South America, 10% in North America, and 15 in Asia. Just for the sake of comparison, these days 99% of Buddhists and 99% of Hindus live in Asia. If we talk about Islam, 70% of Muslims live in Asia, 27% in Africa, and only about 3-4% on other continents. But Christians today live all over the world. Christian culture has actively influenced and continue to influence the lives of billions of people, even non-Christians. So, who was this Paul that in a sense allowed all this to happen? And why did many of the first disciples of Jesus not recognize Paul's teaching about Jesus and even consider him their enemy, apostate, corrupter of the true message of Jesus and even antichrist? We see how even the closest disciples of Jesus had serious disagreements with Paul. There are reasons why Jesus is perceived as a good Jew, while Paul as a bad Jew. Marcus Bork and John Crossan claim that Paul is a controversial figure to many Christians. Some find him appealing and others find him appalling. Paul was involved in many conflicts with Apostle Peter, with his previous spiritual mentor Barnabas, with various communities of believers and so on. In the Cambridge Companion to St. Paul, it states, Paul remained a subject of controversy, not only among his conservative Jewish countrymen, but also within the early church. For example, Catholics didn't pay much attention to Paul and his message, but why is it so? Who was this mysterious man? Let's try to understand his life and ideas, as well as why some experts think that if we want to understand the core of the historical early church, then the most important part of the New Testament is presented in less than two pages. It is the first and second chapter of Galatians. Indeed, they reveal the struggle of Paul against other apostles and his desire to establish his independence from the mother church in Jerusalem and to promote what he called my gospel, that comes not from man, but through direct revelation from God. Please be aware that this review is not dedicated to the Paul of faith, but to Paul as a historical figure. We'll focus on how scholars have tried to understand the historical portrait of this man. Right from the start, I must say that it is not an easy task, because Paul wore many different hats and for different groups of people he presented himself differently. As he claims, to the Jews I became like a Jew, to win the Jews. To those under the law I became like one under the law. To those not having the law I became like one not having the law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak I became weak, to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. Another obstacle is that we have evidence of forgery and pseudoepigrapha, when some people presented themselves as Paul and thus spread their own ideas on behalf of Paul. Let me also start by saying that Jesus and Paul are two people who historically never met each other, although Paul claimed he had the mystical encounters with Jesus. Let me repeat it, Paul and Jesus never met each other. Another important thing to remember is that we don't have even a single word written by Jesus, but we have at least seven letters written by Paul. This means that scholars have some material to study the personality and ideas of this man. So let's see what academics say about Paul. As Bork and Crossan claim, we don't know when Paul was born. 
but the most probable guess is the first decade of the first century. This means that Paul and Jesus were probably contemporaries. And Paul was not much younger than Jesus. They both were Jewish, but they grew up in very different surroundings. Jesus in a small Jewish village in Galilee, Paul probably in Tarsus, a major city in southern Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, or Damascus in Syria. In any case, as Paula Fredrickson writes, Paul's social homeland was the multi-ethnic, thus multi-religious Greco-Roman city. While Jesus lived his life in the Jewish homeland, Paul was a product of the Jewish diaspora in the Hellenistic culture. He was a Pharisee born of Pharisees. Also, Paul's first language was Greek. Jesus more likely was born and raised in a simple working-class family, while Paul seems to have grown up in an aristocratic family of Pharisees, receiving a very good education. Bart Ehrman reminds that back then, fewer than 5% of the population of the empire was that lucky. Education was expensive. It is also believed that he studied in Jerusalem under the greatest Jewish intellectual of his day, Rabbi Gamaliel. But as Dale Martin states, we have a reason to doubt it, since it is only expressed in the Book of Acts, and later I'll explain why it's problematic. Paul perhaps had some knowledge of Stoic philosophy, and used it to explain his Christology to Gentiles. In addition, he was a citizen of Rome, and if this is so, then in those days it meant a lot, and could open lots of doors and privileges. Another interesting fact is that Paul's letters are considered to be the earliest sources about Jesus of Nazareth. Let me repeat, out of all early Christian sources available to us today, the letters of Paul are the earliest. They were written probably around the year 50 CE. Many people think that the Gospels are the earliest accounts about Jesus, but no, they were written decades after Paul's writings. 13 of the 27 books in the New Testament were attributed to Paul and bear his name. One more book, Hebrews, was accepted into the New Testament because church fathers believed wrongly that Paul wrote it. Plus, the book of Acts is largely written about Paul. However, the great majority of scholars believe that only 7 of these 13 letters were almost certainly written by Paul. Experts often call them the undisputed letters. Almost no scholar argues about their authenticity. They are Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Philippians, 1st Thessalonians, and Philemon. Colossians, 2nd Thessalonians, and Ephesians are possibly Deuteropauline, meaning they may have been written by Paul's followers after his death. The three of the remaining letters, 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus, are pseudoepigrapha. Most critical scholars think it was written by some follower of Paul long after his death, but published in his name. Of course, Paul probably wrote dozens of similar letters, but unfortunately only those survived and later became a part of the New Testament. But before we discuss Paul's teaching and ideas about Jesus, let's focus on the historical and socio-political context and see what we know about Paul. Primary, I'd like to say that there is a very popular misconception that Paul had some sort of epiphany moment on his way to Damascus and then he immediately converted into Christianity and began passionately spreading the news about Jesus. Well, we aren't too sure about that. After the conversion, he spent three years in Arabia and Damascus. Only after that, for the first time, he went to meet disciples of Jesus in Jerusalem. Moreover, after this, he seems to have gone to Tarsus and had stayed there until Barnabas found him and brought him to Antioch. Only then he started his mission under the guidance of Barnabas. If it's true, and if Barnabas would not have invited Paul into a mission, then who knows, maybe history would never hear about such person as Paul of Tarsus. But as always, when we try to understand some historical events, things get very complicated. So let's leave speculations aside. We have indications that Paul was a highly religious and zealous Jew, who followed the tradition of Pharisees and strictly followed the Jewish law. Before accepting Jesus, he persecuted his followers. Then, in Galatians, Paul tells us that God revealed his Son to me, and in the letter of Corinthians, Paul states that Jesus appeared to him, 
So he had some sort of moment of realization and decided to accept Jesus. This happened somewhere in Theodis, a few years after Jesus' death. The book of Acts described the story of conversion on the road to Damascus, but we don't know how much of it we can trust. As Bart Ehrman explains, it's true that many people, when they want to learn something about Paul, simply read the book of Acts, since it tells the story of his conversion and mission. But for scholars of early Christianity, it poses a problem, because it was more likely written after about 20 years from Paul's death, or about 50 years from his conversion to the Jesus movement, and possibly was based on the oral tradition. Scholars suggest that Paul died around year 64 CE, but the book of Acts is written after the Gospel of Luke that was written during the year 80-85 CE. Just a reminder, the book of Acts and the Gospel of Luke were written by the same person. Experts have noticed many discrepancies between so-called undisputed letters of Paul and the way the author of Acts presents Paul and his ideas. It doesn't mean we must completely ignore the book of Acts, but we must take it with some amount of skepticism. For example, scholars state that the author of Acts had temptation to locate Paul in Tarsus because it was famous as a major center of learning, and if Paul was from Tarsus, it gives him academic credentials. Therefore, keep in mind that nothing here is definite, but rather they are educated guesses of experts in the field. For instance, Dale Martin explains the reason why we cannot fully trust neither Paul's account nor the author of Acts, because they both had their agenda and reasons to be biased. For more on that, please see also chapter 3 of Paula Fredrickson, Paul the Pagan's Apostle. But here is a quote from Dale Martin. Note also that by Paul's number 17 years passed after his vision before he is seen by anyone in Jerusalem except Peter and James. This simply cannot be squared with the account in Acts of Paul's multiple appearances in Jerusalem, his persecution of the churches there, his arguments later with other Jews, and his other two visits from the Antioch. The two accounts contradict one another. That is why Martin kind of concludes that when we examine Luke and Acts, their author also has an agenda. He clearly goes out of his way to portray the early church with little or no internal conflict. He also wants the center and origin of all church missions and policies to proceed from Jerusalem outward. And he wants to present Paul as of lower official status in the church than the Twelve and James. As scholars recognize, the author of Acts had his own reasons for telling the story the way he did. He exaggerates Paul's presence in Jerusalem and Judea, and he exaggerates Paul's dependence on the Jerusalem apostles and church. He also minimizes conflict. In general, we must remember that the church in Antioch played a crucial role in the life of Paul. In his letters he doesn't emphasize it, but this is more likely because of his conflict with Barnabas, who in the beginning seems to be a spiritual mentor of Paul. But let's get back to Paul's conversion. I want to emphasize it again, that after his decision to accept Jesus, Paul decidedly did not go to Jerusalem to join the Jews who follow Jesus or consult with the apostles of Jesus. He claims to go to Arabia. And only after three years, he visited Jerusalem and met with Christians there. If you've noticed, I use the word Christians, but we must remember that followers of Jesus did not use this word. Only later, other people start calling them Christians. Nowhere in the New Testament does Paul use the word Christian. During this three-year period, Paul apparently revised his entire theology. Bork and Croissant suggest that it was Nabatea where he spent his time. Some experts such as Daniel Bayarin, Alan Segel, and Timo Escola believe that Paul's view and mystical experience were influenced by Jewish Merkaba mystic tradition and apocalyptic ideas that the last days would soon come. Pharisees were apocalypticists. Therefore, Ehrman states, before believing in Jesus, Paul thought that the resurrection was soon to come. When he came to believe that Jesus was raised, he concluded that the end was already here. Only three years later, he went to Jerusalem, where he met Peter for the first time and stayed with him for 15 days. Paul insists that at that time, he saw no other apostle except James, Jesus' brother. 
he writes that he then went to Syria or Cilicia. Bork and Krasan suggest that Paul failed his mission in Arabia. They write, Paul may well have been crushed by his inaugural failure and stumbled home to recover. During these years in Tarsus, Hipperharps was not active as a Christian and did not actively proselytize. Hacker writes, there is not the slightest hint in our sources of the existence of Christian communities founded by the Apostle during this Cilician period of his life. From Acts we see that Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. Before that, Paul did not have any official function within the structures of the early church. It was Barnabas who made him a leading member of the church at Antioch and shared with him his task of teaching. Later we see how Paul was sent on a mission to Cyprus and Galatia, but with and under Barnabas. For many years Paul seems to travel from city to city of modern Greece and Turkey and tries to establish church communities. Here is a map from Ehrman's textbook where we can see three categories, places that are associated with Paul mentions in the Acts, in his undisputed and also disputed letters. Based on the accounts, experts suggest that more likely Paul was a manual laborer of some sort. He worked with leather goods and possibly made tents. This was his strategy. He would arrive in town usually capital cities, and set up a small business and then start converting his customers to his version of Judaism. After building a small group of followers, he would move to another major urban area such as Ephesus, Thessalonica, Corinth and so forth. So keep in mind he normally targeted big cities. But please also keep in mind that Paul's version of Christianity was quite different from what the disciples of Jesus would preach in Judea. While Jesus' focus was on God, Paul shifted this focus from God to Jesus. He in a sense invented the theology and doctrine of the future religion known to us as Christianity. Many so-called church fathers and later theologians, such as Augustine, Aquinas, Luther, used teachings of Paul for inspiration. So Paul created the foundation of Christian theology and more than anyone else known to us helped to transform Christianity away from the religion proclaimed by Jesus to the religion about Jesus. And of course, it creates lots of problems with those disciples who knew Jesus personally. Paul on his end proudly presented himself as Jesus' apostle who never met Jesus and his disciples and that he draws his ideas not from man but directly from God through revelations. He is thus independent from the main church in Jerusalem and their form of Christianity. It seems as if Paul deliberately ignores the disciples of Jesus. As Ehrman states, Paul in his letters gives very little indications that he knew much at all about the things Jesus said and did during his life. To many disciples of Jesus, the deeds and not creeds was what made more sense, but for Paul it was faith. So Catholics may not like it, but Lutherans do. But we must remember that Luther also took too extreme approach in focusing too much on the faith alone. He seems to also misrepresent some ideas of Paul. For example, Luther thought that Paul was anti-Jewish. What is also interesting is that in his letters Paul never mentioned Jesus' miracles, parables or sermons, no details about healing people or about the birth of Jesus, his mother or family members, none of that. He also never teaches about hell or trinity. There is no Easter or Christmas in his theology. All these concepts appear in Christianity much later. As we know it, when Paul came to a town, the first thing he did, he went to a synagogue. And only after being rejected, he would go to preach to Gentiles. And this was quite revolutionary, because who could imagine that some non-Jews would be interested in Jewish religious ideas and practices. But in fact, there were such pagans even before Paul. And Paul, by his own words, considered himself a missionary not to Jews, but to Gentiles. Here is a summary of Paul's message to Greek Gentiles according to Dale Martin. He told them that first, the God of Israel was the only true and living God. Second, Jesus was the Son of God. Third, 
God was angry with the world because of its sin and practices of idolatry. Fourth, Jesus had been crucified and raised from the dead by God. And fifth, Jesus would be returning to rescue those loyal to him from the divine wrath that was on its way soon. Such message was quite suitable for Gentiles, but not so much for Jews. When Paul speaks of his ministry, he sometimes stresses two priorities. First, that he consider himself as called to evangelize among non-Jews. And second, that he preferred as a rule to play the part of a missionary pioneer in planting churches and not to build on the foundation laid by somebody else. But let's try to understand more the historical and social context of the world where Paul lived. Maybe it will help us to understand why Paul chose such strategy. Paula Fredrickson describes very well how different his environment was from Judea. She asks us to situate Paul's letter between their two generative contexts, the scriptural and the social. The first has to do with apocalyptic hope of Jews expressed in their sacred texts and traditions of Israel. The second, the world of the Greco-Roman city, where Paul acted as an apostle. It was explicitly pagan social context, the one into which Jewish population had been comfortably settled for centuries. Many of those Jews were seriously influenced by the Hellenistic culture. Fredrickson mentions, Jews themselves participated to a varying degree in pagan activities, especially if they themselves were athletes, actors, and or citizens. Klaus Hacker in the Cambridge Companion to St. Paul states that scholars viewed Antioch as a melting pot of cultures and tradition, comparable to places like New York or Los Angeles today. It was the third largest city of the empire after Rome and Alexandria, with about a half million population. So you can imagine in what place Paul's version of Christianity was born and evolved. He was surrounded by a very different culture compared to Jesus' disciples in Judea. Scholars may argue to what degree Judea and the early church was Hellenized, but it is obvious that the atmosphere of Greco-Roman Antioch had its impact on Paul. From the New Testament we see that the important innovation of Antioch was the inclusion of Gentiles in the church and the beginning of an organized missionary outreach to other regions. Back then, in many cities and synagogues, there were already non-Jews who were interested in Judaism, so-called proselytes or God-fearers, and Paul was converting them as well. But here we see that some Hellenized diaspora Jews that accepted Jesus started reaching out to the Greek audience or these Gentile God-fearers. Scholars cannot claim that it was only Antiochian phenomena, perhaps not. But there is a big chance that from Antioch the mission to the Gentiles started. And eventually it radically transformed the character of the early Jesus movement. Ultimately, it helped to turn this sect between Judaism into a global Gentile religion. But pay attention that the massive conversion was coming not from conservative Judea, but from liberal Antioch. The movement in Jerusalem consisted of circumcised Jews who kept following Jewish law. They would not even sit at the same table with Gentiles. Remember what Jesus said according to Matthew? Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. But people in Antioch were more liberal and open-minded. Most likely, it wasn't Paul who invented such liberal approach, but he was a product of this Greco-Roman culture. As a result, we can see a sort of clash between Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. The conflict arose. Some conservative Jews or Pharisees who believed in Jesus demanded that pagans that joined Judaism must be circumcised and follow the Jewish law and traditions. Paul, however, did not ask them to do so. So the contradiction arose and Paul had to go to Jerusalem to resolve that issue. He had to prove the reasonable necessity of this policy. And this is so-called the Council of Jerusalem, is considered to be one of the most important turning points in the history of Christianity. It happened after 17 years from Paul's conversion to Jesus. After the debate, church elders in Jerusalem decided that the Gentiles that converted to Judaism didn't have to be circumcised. 
And now, after winning the debate and after receiving the green light to establish his independence from other apostles, Paul returned to Antioch. He took a companion Silas and made a journey to many places that he visited before, plus some new ones. He seems very happy that his style was approved, he now had more freedom and passion to convert non-Jews to Judaism. Some scholars even suggest that the conflict between Petrine and Pauline Christianity in the earliest church, foreshadowing of the Reformation conflict between Catholicism, characterized as like Judaism in its attachment to the formal and external, and Protestantism, regarded as like Pauline Christianity in its attachment to the inner and spiritual. But here I'd like to mention an important thing. The Antiochian community had money. Money, money, money. They always play big role. Money. So Judea seems to struggle financially, and it was Antioch that supported them. Of course, leaders of the church in Judea could join other conservative Jews or Pharisees and reject the Pauline approach and demand that all converts must be circumcised and follow the Jewish law strictly. It's reasonable to assume that in the dispute between Peter and Paul, the authority of Peter should dominate. Peter could say, hey Paul, who are you by the way? You never saw Jesus. Well, I've been his closest disciple, his right hand. No one was as close to him as I was, and now you are trying to teach me what to do? Yet we see that Peter and James overcame the pressure from their conservative fellows and let Paul and Barnabas proceed on their way. Possibly it was because the mother church in Judea was not as influential at that time. There are some indications that Judea survived hard time related to drought and famine, and the whole population wasn't in the best financial shape. And Judea depending on the Antiochian community financially. So maybe it's also played its role in the decision making, but those are just speculation. We don't know for sure, but eventually Paul won the argument, despite the opposition from many other followers of Jesus' movement. Paul even calls himself an apostle on equal footing with those in Judea. This is how Paul calls himself. We also see that he doesn't show any authentic respect to those who were close to Jesus. Vice versa, he is trying to denigrate their authority. In Galatians 2 he states, Some of them were supposed to be important leaders, but I didn't care who they were. God doesn't have any favorites. None of these so-called special leaders added anything to my message. They realized God had sent me with the good news for Gentiles and he had sent Peter with the same message for Jews. God, who had sent Peter on a mission for the Jews, was now using me to preach to the Gentiles. James, Peter and John realized that God had given me the message about his gift of undeserved grace. And these men are supposed to be the backbone of the church. They even gave Barnabas and me a friendly handshake. This was to show that we would work with Gentiles and they would work with Jews. I don't know if you could capture it, but we can see some sort of arrogance in the way Paul treats closest disciples of Jesus and his brother. Later we can see how Paul even rebukes Peter. But when Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him in public, because he was clearly wrong. Before some men who had been sent by James arrived there, Peter had been eating with the Gentile believers. But after this man arrived, he drew back and would not eat with the Gentiles, because he was afraid of those who were in favor of circumcising them. The other Jewish believers also started acting like cowards along with Peter, and even Barnabas was swept along by their cowardly action. When I saw that they were not walking a straight path in line with the truth of the gospel, I say to Peter in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you have been living like a Gentile, not like a Jew. How then can you try to force Gentiles to live like Jews? Just a quick reminder that nearly all experts of early Christianity around the world agree that those are authentic words of Paul. He may exaggerate here, but he actually wrote these words. Eventually we see that Paul seems to have a conflict with Barnabas as well and decided to move away from Antioch and proselytize what he thought was right, his own gospel. 
From the New Testament we see how much opposition Paul had to face. Many people hated him, even wanted to kill him and consider him an apostate or even an enemy of the true Jesus movement. And those were followers of Jesus, can you imagine? Ebionites were especially angry with him. According to the Acts, he even had to perform various Jewish rituals to prove to his fellow Christians that he still respect Jewish law and followed it. For more on the difference between those Christians who mainly lived in Judea or those who were more Hellenized but still understood themselves to be a part of Jewish tradition, see Daniel Bayarin's work. Many Christians in the first century strictly followed Jewish law and were indistinct indistinguishable, oh gosh, I made this word, indistinguishable from other Jews. Anyway, as we may see historically, the Pauline version of Christianity gained more acceptance, for the reason why eventually out of many forms of early Christianity the most successful one became the Roman version, I might later make a separate video. But when Paul broke from the leaders in Jerusalem or Barnabas, he had huge ambitions, as John Crossan explains, to Paul this was not Christianity against Judaism, this was Christian Judaism against Roman imperialism. He wanted to conquer the whole Roman Empire, therefore he targeted major capital cities and wanted to reach out even to Spain. Oh, on one hand, I feel not comfortable or professional to give such analogy, but after thinking for a while I decided to bring it in here anyway. But please take into consideration that it is a very rough analogy. Imagine for a second that there is some Guru X in Sri Lanka. He builds his spiritual community that is based on the local folklore, culture and ancient texts. The movement isn't that big, about 1000 members. Imagine someone who was born and raised in Los Angeles, but whose parents are from Sri Lanka. Imagine that he got familiar with Guru X movement and decided to teach Americans about his understanding of that movement. I think it's not difficult to imagine such a situation. Let's say he calls himself Guru Y. Now over 50,000 Americans, Mexicans and Canadians join this movement. They have never been to Sri Lanka, but they are extremely interested in its culture. As a result, Guru Y now possesses lots of power and resources. Do you think it will have an impact on the movement in Sri Lanka? Will it transform some of its doctrines? And if so, will it be easy for members in Sri Lanka to recognize the authority and the teaching of Guru Y, who never met with Guru X and doesn't care much what close disciples of Guru X are teaching? Sorry for making such analogy, it is very rough and inaccurate. But I hope it helped at least a bit to understand why many Jews could be really upset with Paul. Now let me add a few more important things about Paul, mainly their misunderstandings about him and his theology. Bart Ehrman explains that Paul took very seriously the Jewish scriptures, especially the book of Isaiah, that indicated that at the end of the age all nations would come to worship the true God. Everyone, Jew and Gentile, would eventually acknowledge the God of Israel. And Paul didn't abandon that view once he became a follower of Jesus. On the contrary, he started to believe that the way the Gentiles would come to be the people of God, along with the Jews, was not through the law at all, but through accepting the sacrificial death and resurrection of Jesus. This is why, as a Christian, Paul maintained that Gentiles who wanted to be right with God needed to believe in Jesus and didn't need to keep the law. The law was given to the Jews, but it doesn't save the Jews. Only Christ saves the Jews. And Christ saves the Gentiles as well, but not by having them become Jews. He saves them as Gentiles. Do you get this idea? So it is wrong to think of Paul as someone who abandoned Judaism and became a Christian or even anti-Jew. No, in his mind he was not an apostate. It is the opposite, through Jesus he thought he became a true Jew. Through Jesus he rediscovered Judaism, so he never thought of being converted to some new religion. Ehrman writes, he still considers himself a faithful Jew. He never ever thought that he himself was abandoning the Jewish religion in which he had been raised or the Torah that he had always revered. Moreover, according to Fredrickson, Bohr, Krasan and other scholars, 
Paul never thought of himself as a founder of a new religion or as a representative of a new religion. This was later when the first church fathers departed from Judaism. Some scholars claim that the true creators of Christianity were the Apostle Paul and his followers, but not Jesus and his disciples. The disciples of Jesus, Peter, John and James, preached the teaching of the Son of Man, but their supposed uh, ideological opponent, Paul, emphasized the resurrection of the Son of God, which corresponded to the mythology of the pagans. So it is possible that in the second century, those who converted from paganism focus on the authority of Paul's ideas about Jesus and thus created foundation for anti-Jewish type of Christianity. Some scholars remind us that Martin Luther based his anti-Semitism in the writings of Paul. Andrew Walls, for example, reminds us that it was hardly possible to meet a Jew at the Council of Nicaea. Rather, they were even hostile to the Jews. The paradox is that 300 years ago, at the first church council in Jerusalem, all church leaders were Jews. Can you imagine the scale of the contrast? Here everyone is Jew, and here no one is Jew. Is this the same religion? But here we must be careful with any conclusions. Paul could be highly misrepresented. Some may have a temptation to make Paul some sort of superhero and the founder of Christianity, avoiding the impact of all other early Christians. But we must not think of him as anti-Jew. What we do know is that the Emperor Constantine had a strong anti-Jewish bias. And through his edicts and attitude he helped to create the basis for anti-Jewish type of Christianity. It was very different from the type of Christianity that Paul was proclaiming. Therefore, some scholars indicate that it was under the influence of Constantine that the early church fathers invented something different from the Christianity of Paul. Eventually, out of many forms of Christianities, it was the Roman version that had gained popular acceptance while suppressing other manifestations of Christian thought. That is why it's not accurate to call only Paul the inventor of Christianity. It seems as though Paul always thought of himself as a Jew, he simply knew the struggles of those who wanted to convert to Christianity from paganism. Yes, he decided to take a very flexible position towards new Gentile converts and let them eat whatever they wanted, not get circumcised or observe Mosaic law to be saved. On the other hand, he was quite strict with Gentiles. According to Fredrickson, Paul is radically Judaiz Judaizing pagans. Did I say it right? Judaizing or Judaizing? Anyway. Paul is radically Judaizing pagans. For example, he was fine with them ignoring some ritual practices, but he wants them to accept Jewish theology and ethics. The main concern was for them to become eschatological Gentiles and start believing in the coming of the kingdom and the resurrection of the dead. But because his attitude toward the Jewish law had changed, he was criticized. Did he teach the authentic message of Jesus? Well, first of all, I don't think today anyone can claim knowing what the authentic teaching of Jesus was. At the same time, we can probably say that Paul indeed came up with some new theology. Paul is separating faith and law. For the Jews of that time, it was a radical idea. At some point, he went as far as teaching Gentiles that you who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ you have fallen away from grace. Notice he's not saying that you are going to fall away from grace if you sin. That doesn't seem to be the problem. He's saying if you Gentile followers of Jesus even attempt to keep the Jewish law, you'll be cut off from the grace of God. And this is what makes Paul's message really radical in the eyes of many followers of Jesus. Because to them Jesus did not prioritize his divinity, but the fulfillment of the law. The crucifixion, the idea of atonement for sins, didn't play any special role among first Christians, but Paul began to focus on the divinity of Jesus, his death and resurrection. So the law is not so important, but the death of Jesus is what really saves us. And it seems it was true that due to such liberal approach to the law, some Jews that joined communities founded by Paul stopped observing Jewish law as strictly as they used to. That is, Paul liberalized the Jews in this regard. 
In his mind, Jesus came not to fulfill the law, but to abolish it, to free Jews and others from the law. Of course, for some Christians it was so shocking, especially for the Ebionites. How dare you say that the Jewish Messiah came to abolish the Jewish law and that the whole Torah is no longer important? Therefore, they consider Paul to be an Antichrist who came to destroy the Jewish law. And this is where Paul was misunderstood by many people. But remember what I've mentioned before about his theology. I'll repeat, Paul thought of himself as a Jew. He didn't see himself as an apostate, as somebody who abandoned his Jewish faith. No, for many of us, Paul is a Christian, maybe even a founder of Christianity. But to Paul, Christianity was a form of Judaism, but not an opposition to Judaism. He was born as a Jew and died as a devout Jew. Simply in the Christ, the Jewish scripture was fulfilled. At the same time, he obviously had a serious impact on how the version of Judaism from a marginal community of poor peasants from distant Galilee in a very modified form achieved popularity throughout the Roman Empire. Such success of Christianity in many ways is the merit of Paul. Although, according to the opinion of most experts, Paul didn't plan to create a new religion. He was convinced that Jesus was about to return during his lifetime, that the last days and the judgment of God were at hand. But in the end, Christianity went its own way. And within a few centuries, Paul would probably would have been shocked at what Christianity had become. Before I finish, let me bring two more important things about some possible misconceptions about Paul. First one has to do with his probable sexism and support of slavery, and the second with his probable monotheism. Bork and Krasan emphasize the inaccurate stereotype of Paul. There is a reason why Jesus is perceived as a good Jew, while Paul as a bad Jew. There are passages from letters attributed to Paul that endorse slavery, subordinate women, and condemn homosexual behavior. They have been used for much of Christian history to justify systems of oppression. Some of them indeed are problematic. But are these stereotypes true? Bork and Krasan think not. In the New Testament we can find at least three different portraits of Paul. These are conservative Paul, liberal Paul, and radical Paul. And it turns out that depending on our preferences, we can focus on one and ignore the other portraits. And the problem is that some of the letters were written by him and others were only attributed to him. For example, a conservative Paul is expressed in both letters to Timothy, but they certainly were not written by Paul. Here, for example, he silences the woman and asks them to stay home and obey their husband. The liberal Paul we find in Ephesians and Colossians, which were also not written by him. Here, for example, he says that women should obey their husbands, but then spends a lot more time telling husbands that they should sacrifice themselves for their wives. But the radical Paul we find in his authentic letters, where he speaks of the equality of man and woman, slaves and free, Jews and Gentiles, here we see how he delegates high responsibilities to women. In general, Bork and Croissant are claiming that the real Paul's message was radically egalitarian. He saw all people, regardless of gender, social status and so on, as fundamentally equal in Christ and before God. Offers bring numerous passages to portray the version of Paul as a social justice warrior. It is also important to remember that, according to some scholars, there was no such thing as monotheism in the first century. What existed is the idea that my God is more powerful than yours. In the Bible, God is fighting with other gods, and Christ also in his coming must fight other pagan gods. So, according to Fredrickson, Paul was not a monotheist. In her first chapter, Israel and the Nations, she argues that Jews even in the first centuries were henotheists, but not monotheists. Even the phrase that we find in inscription, one God in heaven, asserted superiority, not singularity. Thus, even though Paul already had a quite high Christology in his views of who Jesus was, Fredrickson claims that Paul was not a strict monotheist in our modern sense, and he was not doing Nicene Christology. 
Paul was declaring a messianic apocalyptic movement of approaching redemption. He expected the resurrection of the dead and the cosmic resolution of the problem of evil within his lifetime. And most of critical scholars agree that Paul believed that Jesus would return within his lifetime. Therefore, not only Jesus was not aware that he created a new religion, Fredrickson doesn't believe that Paul was aware that he created a new religion. Moreover, since he thought that Jesus would very soon return to earth to establish the kingdom of God on earth, Paul's attitude toward the material world and real social reforms was not well established. His focus was on the second coming and salvation. Let's conclude. In the end, I must admit that scholars still disagree on many issues related to Paul. His theology, his ethics, his attitude toward Judaism, whether he is in line with 1st century Judaism or opposing it, his expectation from Gentiles, his long-term vision and so on. Even though we have enough data, we must admit that Paul was not always the same. Like many of us, his ideas and vision evolved over time. It was a process. Paul was stubborn with some issues, but also very flexible on many others. He wanted to be accepted in many different cultural settings, so he had to adapt under different circumstances and conditions and therefore wear many hats. It makes our attempt to understand the real portrait of the historical Paul really hard. As Dale Martin states, for any historian, a good working motto is the omnibus dubitandum, doubt everything. That doesn't mean that historians reject all accounts in the end, just that we must begin with skepticism and test the sources we have, asking how they may be biased, where they got their information and what their purposes in writing were. And yet we see how profoundly the ideas of Paul have influenced the doctrine of Christianity, and this way the whole history of mankind. It wasn't much the teaching of Jesus himself, nor the teaching of Peter or other closest disciples of Jesus, but the teaching of Paul, who never physically met Jesus in his lifetime, that largely determined the fate of Christianity. It was Paul who helped the ideas of the Jewish rabbi from Nazareth to turn into a global, multicultural religion which influences a third of all the inhabitants of the planet today. Is this not a success? Friends, if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and a comment. Also, please consider subscribing and pressing the bell button because many new videos on the Hebrew Bible, the New Testament and many other topics are coming soon. And if you like what I do, please consider supporting my channel through Patreon or PayPal. The links are in the description. Thank you.